Today we want to explore the traitorous emotion known either as wrath or anger or rage. But first, did you know that Time of Grace has an app? If you want a change of pace and want to grow in your faith by watching our videos instead of listening to our podcasts, you can do that on our app. You'll also find our videos that take you deep into God's Word, from our daily Grace Talks video devotions, to Pastor Mike's weekly message series, to Pastor Jeremy's Bible Basics series called Bible Breath, to many more. Just search Time of Grace wherever you get your apps. The Bible is incredibly interconnected with threads that run through it from beginning to end. In this podcast, I will uncover these threads, help you dig deeper into God's truth, and inspire you to live your life with greater confidence and joy. Welcome to Bible Threads with me, Dr. Bruce Becker. Today's episode and topic poses a bit of a challenge for us. That's because there is a deadly sin known either as wrath, anger, or rage. But there's also a human emotion that can be described as righteous anger. In other words, anger that is justified. Then there is also a third type of anger. It's what the Bible calls the wrath of God, which is totally different than the human sin of anger. Although the focus of this episode is on the deadly sin of either wrath, anger, or rage, I do want to talk a bit about righteous anger as well as the wrath of God. More on that later. Let's start with the deadly sin of anger, which I'm going to refer to with the word rage, just to minimize the confusion between the three types of anger that we just mentioned. So, what is rage? Rage can be summed up as a strong, vengeful hatred or resentment. The word vengeful in the definition indicates that there is a close connection between the three R's, rage, resentment, and revenge. King David wrote about rage in one of his Psalms. He said it leads only to evil. His son Solomon wrote a proverb that used rage to contrast fools with the wise. He wrote, Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Solomon points out that fools give a full venting to their rage. Now, the Hebrew word translated as a fool means a stupid person who doesn't seek understanding. You ever get the sense that the Bible doesn't soft-pedal it on what a fool is? The New Testament also addresses what rage is and its result. The Apostle James wrote, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger, in other words, rage, does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. The Apostle Paul also wrote about rage. He said, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be a benefit to those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. In this verse, the Apostle Paul uses two different words for anger. He says get rid of rage, which is the volatile emotion to describe sinful anger. The other word he uses, translated as anger, has the idea of punishment, specifically God's punishment. Let's take a look at a few examples in the Bible where rage turned into resentment, which then led to revenge. 
In our last episode on Envy, we explored the story of Cain and Abel. With Cain, it all started with Envy. Cain was envious of God's acceptance of his brother Abel's offering, but not his. The envy quickly turned into rage against God and resentment against Abel. The final result was revenge. Cain killed his brother Abel. In some cases in the Bible, rage developed out of envy. In other cases, rage developed out of a hateful heart. Recall the definition of rage, a strong, vengeful hatred or resentment? An example of rage flowing from a hateful heart can be seen in the life of Jacob's sons. The patriarch Jacob had twelve sons. The second youngest was Joseph, who was Jacob's favorite son, because he was born to him in his old age. Now, although the Bible doesn't tell us specifically, Joseph was also the firstborn son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. The Bible does tell us that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah or their concubines. Jacob made Joseph a special robe, one that was richly ornamented. As Tim Rice described it in the 1972 musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, This dream coat set Joseph apart from his brothers. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So we see the brothers' rage and resentment because of Joseph's amazing technicolor dream coat. But there's more. Joseph had a couple of dreams that he just couldn't resist sharing with his brothers. The upshot of both dreams was that Joseph's father and mother and all of his brothers would bow down to Joseph someday. Now, they would indeed bow down to him when Joseph was the number two ruler in all of Egypt. But this didn't create any goodwill between Joseph and his brothers to be told what the dreams were about. It increased the rage and resentment all the more. Until one day the brothers had an opportunity to take revenge on their little brother. They sold him as a slave to a group of Midianite merchants who were part of a caravan passing by on their way to Egypt. And the selling price? A half a pound of silver. There is another example of rage in the Old Testament worth mentioning because it led to murder. It involved Joab, King David's general, who, by the way, was also David's nephew. Also involved was Abner who was the commander-in-chief of King Saul's army. By the way, he was also Saul's cousin. There sure was a lot of nepotism in the Old Testament, don't you think? One day, Saul's son Ish-bosheth suggested to General Abner that he sleep with one of Saul's concubines, a woman by the name of Rizpah. Abner was outraged at Ishbosheth for suggesting that he do such a despicable thing against his king. That day, Abner decided to switch sides and support David. Long story short, David welcomed Abner to his side, had a feast prepared for him and his men, and sent him away to influence the nation of Israel to follow David as king. After Abner had left King David, Joab returned from a military raid and brought back a great deal of plunder. When Joab learned that David had welcomed Abner, he was filled with rage. He said to his king, What have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why did you let him go? Now he is gone. You know Abner, son of Ner, he came to deceive you and to observe your movements and find out everything you are doing. So, what made Joab so filled with rage against Abner? Well, if we go back a chapter in 2 Samuel 3, we learn that Abner had killed Joab's brother, Azahel, in a battle. Azahel had been pursuing Abner, and Abner tried to convince Azahel to stop pursuing him and and turn to the side. But when he didn't stop, Abner turned around and plunged the butt of his sword into Azahel. Azahel's stomach, so far, in fact, that it came out the other side. 
Back to the story. After Joab expressed his outrage to King David about letting Abner go, he secretly sent men to track down Abner and bring him back to Hebron. Now when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gateway, as though to speak to him privately, and there to avenge the blood of his brother Azahel, stabbed him in the stomach, and Joab died. For Joab, rage turned to resentment, resentment turned to revenge, and revenge resulted in murder. Another example from the Old Testament that demonstrates the dreadful consequences of rage is from the book of Esther. The book of Esther occurred in the Persian city of Susa, located just east of Babylon. Esther was King Xerxes' queen. Esther's cousin was Mordecai, a leader of the Jewish people. Then there was another character. His name was Haman a government official who attempted to annihilate all of the Jewish people. And the reason why? The book of Esther tells us, When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Because Mordecai would not pay Haman honor, Haman's rage ignited, and he wanted not only to kill Mordecai, but to commit genocide against all of the Jewish people living in the Persian Empire. Haman finagled a way to get a law passed that would annihilate all the Jewish people on a single day. Then dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. That was Haman's plan. For Haman, we learn that his rage wasn't just a one-time occurrence. That's a characteristic of rage. doesn't easily go away once it takes root in one's heart. One day, Haman went out happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. At the suggestion of his wife, Haman constructed a pole 75 feet in height on which he planned to hang Mordecai. The Lord God turned the tables on Haman through the heroic efforts of Esther and the actions of the king. The Jewish people were spared from annihilation, and Haman himself ended up impaled on the pole he had constructed just for Mordecai. As we've seen in these examples, rage can lead to resentment and even to revenge. Rage is like a fire burning through the dry underbush of a forest or sweeping across the dry foothills of the California Sierra Mountains. Rage consumes and destroys. Alexander the Great, who was one of the greatest military conquerors in the history of the world, recognized that the rage of his men had the potential to end his reign. He said, How happy had it been for me had I been slain in the battle. It had been far more noble to have died the victim of the enemy than fall a sacrifice to the rage of my friends. Rage can lead to resentment. Resentment can lead to revenge. Rage can cause us to act irrationally and immorally. As King David said, rage only leads to evil. That's why rage is a traitor in our lives. It can destroy our relationships with others, with God, and can ruin life itself. That's the disastrous results of rage. So, what about righteous anger? What is it? Well, first we need to understand that anger in and of itself isn't wrong. If you don't believe me, then listen to what the Apostle Paul told the Christians living in Ephesus. He wrote, In your anger do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, don't sin when you are angry. The apostle also encouraged them not to go to bed angry and not to let the devil use their anger to get his claws into them. So, what exactly is righteous anger? Righteous anger stems from an anger that arises when we see an offense against God or God's truth. It's being angry with a situation that God is already angry about. Maybe the best way to understand righteous anger is to consider two examples of righteous anger from the Bible, one from the Old Testament and the other from the New. After Moses led God's people out of Egypt, the Israelites traveled to Mount Sinai, where the Lord God gave to Moses his moral, civil, and ceremonial laws. These laws were to govern the lives of the Israelites 24-7. To receive these laws, Moses spent a considerable amount of time on the mountain interacting with God. The rest of the people were camped at the base of the mountain. During one of Moses' longer visits to the top of the mountain, 40 days to be exact, the Lord God gave specific instructions for the construction of the tabernacle and how the Israelites were to worship their God, Yahweh. While Moses was on the mountain, the Israelites in the camp grew tired of waiting for Moses, so they built a golden calf to worship. When Moses finally came down the mountain to present to them the stone tablets on which the Lord God himself had inscribed the Ten Commandments, he saw the Israelites committing idolatry by worshiping this golden calf. The very first commandment prohibited idolatry, and here the Israelites were doing just that. Moses became very angry, and in his anger he smashed the two stone tablets. He ordered that the golden calf be destroyed, burned in a fire, and ground into powder. Moses then scattered the powder onto the water and made the Israelites drink it. Moses' anger was a righteous anger because the Israelites had committed an offense against the Lord God by worshiping an idol made of gold. In the New Testament, Jesus showed us what righteous anger looks like on a day early in his ministry when he went to the temple in Jerusalem. The Apostle John records this event in his biographical sketch of Jesus' life and ministry. He wrote, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. The Jews in Jesus' day had turned the temple courts into a marketplace where worshipers could buy, quote, acceptable animals to be sacrificed at the temple. Jesus saw the financial greed of the people selling the animals. With a whip in hand, he drove out the animals, overturned the money changers' tables, and drove them out as well. Jesus, in his righteous anger, sought to restore reverence to the temple court and to send a message that people ought not use the temple as a place where they could make money. Jesus expressed righteous anger. It's anger that is justified because it's in harmony with God's truth. Are you righteously angry about anything going on in your life or in the culture around us? You know, I find myself getting angry and frustrated with the fact that there are so many voices who don't support protecting God's gift of life. The Bible teaches us that life begins at conception. So when people advocate for women's right to kill her unborn child, that raises my level of righteous anger. How about you? I also find myself getting angry and frustrated when the culture around us advocates against God's gift of marriage, sex, and gender. God designed marriage as the lifelong union of one man and one woman, 
period. God designed his gift of sexual intimacy to be reserved for those who are married, period. God designed human beings to be one of two genders, not the hundred and seven gender identities currently being advocated. God's creative design has just two genders, biologically either an XX chromosome, female, or an XY chromosome, male, period. These are the kinds of issues that are producing a measure of righteous anger in my life. What about in yours? This brings us to the final category of anger we want to talk about known as the wrath of God. We won't ever understand the wrath of God unless we first understand God's holiness, his righteousness, and his love. Let's start with holiness. The Bible makes it clear that God is holy. At Mount Sinai, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. The prophet Isaiah saw a vision one day of the Lord God sitting on a throne with angels, seraphim, around him. The seraphim were singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Did you know that this is the only description of God in the Bible repeated in a threefold formula? It's a literary device used for emphasis. God isn't just holy. He is perfectly holy. The main idea behind holiness is absolute moral purity. God is not only good, he is perfectly good. Did you know that the holiness of God is spoken of more frequently in the Bible than any other attribute of God? There are more than a dozen words used to describe the holiness of God, and these words show up about 600 times in just the Old Testament alone. And not just the Old Testament. The New Testament also speaks about the holiness of God. Because God is perfectly holy— he can't stand evil. He can't stand wickedness. He can't stand sin. He demands righteousness. He demands that there be justice for those who do evil. Simply put, God's wrath is the measured response of God's holiness towards evil. Let me say that again. God's wrath is the measured response of God's holiness towards evil. Now, if there wasn't any evil or sin in the world, God's wrath would not exist. Bible scholar and author John Stott described the wrath of God as his steady, unrelenting, unremitting, uncompromising antagonism to evil in all of its forms and manifestations. Although God has no choice but to demonstrate his wrath against evil— God is also merciful to those who have done evil. And that's because God is love. God loves us, not because of anything we've done or because of some quality we have. He loves us because God is love. He loves us despite the fact that because of our sins of pride, greed, rage, and every other sin, we are objects of his wrath. God's holiness required justice for the evil we have done. The good news for us is that God's love found a way to pour out his wrath on our evil without us being the target of his wrath. That's what happened at the cross. On Calvary's cross 2,000 plus years ago, God poured out his wrath against sin, evil, and wickedness on his son, on his son Jesus, instead of on us. Jesus endured the wrath of God that we should have endured. And when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was an acknowledgment that he had endured the wrath of his Father. When Jesus cried out, It is finished. Justice had been served. Jesus had paid the price for our sins. 
Thank God that he found a way to deal with evil without dealing with us. Traitors. More than just the seven deadly sins. They're the attitudes that can betray our relationship with our God, with others, and even with ourselves. Today we saw some examples of how sinful rage can destroy people's lives. And we also saw how the wrath of God destroyed sin and evil through his son Jesus. In our next episode, we'll explore the traitor known as lust. If you have any questions about this podcast, please email me at bruce at timeofgrace.org. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and God bless.